Let's now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'll start reading on verse 1. We are talking about <clears throat> hardship catalogs. And I think uh, it will be a consensus that everybody here went or goes through hardships. Amen. Some are harder than others, but hardship nonetheless. Now, the moment you, you go through difficulties or hardships, our, our attitudes needs to be uh, corrected or we need to have a proper attitude. So let's look now at proper attitude and approach towards hardship when we're talking about suffering for Jesus. Again, this is not suffering because of our own wrongdoing, our sins or foolish decisions. It's because you love the Lord and you are being persecuted. 2 Corinthians 4.1 Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God. But by the manifestation of truth, commanding ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, <clears throat> it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That the veiling of the word of God, the glory, is equated with being an unbeliever, okay? For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bond servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, light shall come, shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of God. Of Jesus Christ. But to have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus Christ will, will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes. Some translation, I think, is for all things are yours. So that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. So by this time, Paul is getting older. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but on the things, at the things which are not seen. For the things 
which are seen as are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, let's let's say this that when some people are play, are are uh, placed under pressure, one of the reactions is they compromise, and we were talking about that this morning. The Bible calls this the way of the wicked. The moment you are put under pressure and you compromise, it's called wickedness. Paul, in contrast, in spite of all the pressure, decided to do the right thing. So let's let's carefully look at how Paul reacted at hardships. And we should learn from that and apply it on our lives as well. Number one, how do we respond to hardship? Number one, do not lose heart. Now there are two things about losing heart. One translation reads, do not give in to evil. So when you give in, when you are being tempted, when you are being tried and you give in, that's losing heart. You have no more, uh, they, they call it, they have no more heart. You know, if, if you're watching sports, for example, if a basketball game goes down the wire, they have an expression that they use. It's no longer about skills. It's no longer about preparations. It's about heart. The one who will win is he who has the heart. So that's one thing. When, when we are being pressured, to compromise, number one, do not give in to evil. That's do not lose heart. The other way of expressing is, do not get discouraged or do not let your heart melt in fear. Uh, one translation reads, do not show fear or do not display cowardice. Cowardice do not belong to leadership. Okay? It do not, cowardice has no place in ministry. Perhaps one of the ways that we can express this is, as in a boxing match, don't throw in the towel. In a taunting game, don't chicken out. That's all it is. That's it because people say, palakasin mo loob mo, you know. Strengthen your heart. Well, what it means is no matter what happened, don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Again, these are the, the alternate translations. Don't be a coward. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Do not lose heart. Therefore, when Paul says your first attitude when they're going through pressures, do not lose heart, it tells us that being a coward is a sub-Christian attitude. Yeah. Now, people are glorifying cowardice now, and they are glorifying fear. You know, very common now. You know? In the, the, old, the old movies that I watch, are you afraid? No, I'm not afraid. And in, in, the, in the old days, uh, men don't cry in the movies. Now they cry. Because it's glorified, we think it's normal to be afraid or normal to be a coward. No, it's not. It's a sub-Christian attitude. Because with the coming of the Holy Spirit, comes the spirit of love, power, and self-discipline, not timidity. 2 Timothy 1.7 God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. The spirit that was given to us is a spirit of courage, not the spirit of fear. Being a coward is condemned in the scriptures. When you throw in the towel, when you give up, look at this, Revelation 21 verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving, look at that, they are equated. For the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Now, you notice that in that sentence, but for the cowardly and unbelieving, what's the next word? and abominable, and then, and murders. Where they tell you about the use of the word and in the Greek, the next time it's used again, how should you translate that? Also. The moment a person starts being cowardly, he is also unbelieving, he is also abominable, it 
it gives in to murderous spirit, its immorality, sorcery, idolatry, and lying. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You see? Therefore, it's misplaced fear. Cowardice is actually misplaced fear. Why? Because of the second death. Jesus said this, Do not fear him who can only kill the body, but fear him who can also throw you to, in hell. That's what you fear. And so cowardice to stand for what is right is actually uh, opposite of what Jesus is saying. It's a misplaced fear. I mean, we are, we are afraid that, that we will lose our job. We are afraid that we will lose this. We will. And Jesus is saying, hey, listen, your, your fear is misplaced. If there is something or someone that you have to fear, it is actually God who not only can take away all of those things from you, but can also throw you in hell. Because the question is, what can man do to you? You know, It has been said, what's the worst thing that your enemy can do to you? Kill you. Okay, they kill you. What happened? You go to heaven. It's the, the most glorious thing. But that is spiritual reasoning. But, but uh, cowardice is misplaced a fear. The moment, the moment you are afraid of someone, uh, you, you become cowardly towards someone, it's misplaced a fear. For, for example, your, your, your friends tell you, why are you so, uh, why do you go to church all the time? You know? What kind of person? You're a man. You're, you're, you're a sissy. Why do you go to church all the time? So you feel intimidated. Right? Well, that's misplaced fear. You feel intimidated by whom? By the people taunting you. Misplaced fear. You begin to be, if she is insulting me, I begin to be afraid of her more than afraid of God. That's why cowardice is misplaced fear. And a lot of people have misplaced fear. I mean, like, like for example, you, you look at it this way. I, I don't want to uh, take the class under that professor. Man, he's a terror. I may fail, you know. Well, he's the best one there is. You have misplaced fear. You are fearing him. What you have to fear is what if you graduate and you can't find a job? Because you are not qualified. You know, people test you, and then you can't pass the test. I had a member in Virginia Beach, and he's an undocumented uh, immigrant. It's not the same time as, as today. The union in, in Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Virginia, took him in, the, the railroad station. They took, him, they took him in and he said, his boss is Italian, and he said, my Italian boss told me, for as long as, as no INS inspector is coming here to take you, uh, you are with me. So he was hired. I said, how did you do it? Because you're undocumented. He said, well, they were looking for engineers. And he said that uh, I finished elec uh, elec electronics and communication engineering at the University of the East. And so they're giving the exams, they're giving interviews, and he said, you know, in the Philippines, you're trained to draw and to illustrate. And he was being asked to uh, explain a certain uh, electronic theory. And he said, I went to the whiteboard. I drew it. I drew a diagram because we are taught to memorize. And he said, the, the people were so impressed because he knows what he was talking about. They were so impressed he knows what he was talking about that they hired him. Actually, that company is the one who petitioned for him to become legal in the U.S., you know, what happened there? Because he said, when he was studying at UE, he always looks for good professors to teach him. But some, some, uh, some students are afraid, misplaced fear. Yeah, you're going to be afraid that the, that the teacher will fail you. What if you don't fail and you learn a lot, you know? So it's misplaced fear. And because of misplaced fear, you acted cowardly. You did not do anything. What if you're afraid? I'm not going to apply because I may, be, I may not be hired. I don't want to be rejected. That's misplaced fear. So what do you fear? For that person to say no or for you to remain without job and hungry? It's misplaced fear. And so a lot of fear that we have is just misplaced. That's why God keeps insisting in the Bible, you have to fear me. Because we 
fear others more than we fear God. Look at this, look at this serpent. Why, why won't you eat the fruit? Well, because on the day that uh, I eat or, or touch it, I'll, I'll die. No, God is not doing that. Actually, God doesn't want you to be like him. Well, it's already like him. You will be like God. You will be wise. You will be this. You will be that. So what happened? This Satan intimidated him. Because Satan cannot generate faith. So he was generating fear. What was he afraid? Whoa. I will not reach my potential. You see, I, I'd rather stop following God because if I follow God, I may not reach my potential. I will not be like, I will not become like God. Well, he's already like God. What he doesn't know is his potential is already being realized, but he was intimidated by Satan because Satan, Satan generates fear. The moment, the moment you encounter Satan, it will not generate happiness or joy. It will generate fear. There's a couple of people that I know have told me that they have seen Satan. And, he, and they, they, both of them told me, uh, one, one was a classmate of my kuya, and, and he said he saw the vision of, of Jesus crucified, and then he saw Satan, and he said, I said, how do you know it's Satan? He said, evil thoughts which I never thought of came to me. He said, the vilest thing that I never thought I could think of came to me. That's the influence of uh, Satan. That's why through those things, you can practice discernment. But losing courage is a sign that we are, we are being influenced by the, by the... When you can no longer stand for what is right, that's the sign of cowardice. This is timidity. This, in, uh, in terms of uh, what Paul is teaching, it's shrinking from coming forward and speaking the word of God. When, when you shrink back and, and you begin to, uh, to be afraid. Today we are seeing in our society a bias against uh, conservatism. I forgot who it was that I was watching on television. And uh, she was is speaking in, uh, in a university, a conservative speech. And suddenly there was, there was like a riot. And the uh, host simply said, do you have some security detail? But I was thinking, man, these people are so convinced about their conservatism that even if they put their lives in danger, they are willing to show up. That's courage, you see. Why? Because what they are more, they have a fear. They don't want to die, of course. But their fear is this. They don't want conservatism to be snapped out. You see, it, cowardice is misplaced fear. Well, I'm afraid that they will insult me. But you're not afraid that your conviction will not be known. Well, well I'm afraid if I, if I witness to them, they'll taunt me and say, I'm religious. Yeah, but you're not afraid that they'll go to hell. You see, it's misplaced fear. You choose who will make you afraid. Now, the Bible says you have to fear God. And really, what Jesus said is, do not fear him who can only kill your body. Fear him who can also cast you in hell. Christians uh, are not supposed to be cowards. Supposedly, there are no Christian cowards. <laughs> Let me repeat that again. Okay? Supposedly, there are no Christian cowards. <laughs> no, I don't mean hindi ka kakabahan, di ba? Oh, because we, we equate uh, courage with... Hindi, hindi, oh, well, you may feel that. You may feel that, oh, can, I, can I really do it? But you show up. That's courage. When in spite of extreme pressure, you show up. Fear is you just don't show up. That's why you melt in fear. That's the statement. What happens when you melt in, in fear? You disappear because you just melt. You show up. That's what it means. Now, the second thing is this. You don't get intimidated like that because because why? Because this is what we have been given. It's called ministry. We're studying that. This ministry we have received from the Lord. Man did not give it to us. The ministry that we have been given is not man. It's not given by, by man. Now, it, it appears sometimes it's given by man, but actually it's given by God. And so because this has been given to us, okay? Now, in, the, uh, in times of war, if your commander in the battlefield tell you do something, you do it. 
you can't run away. What happens if you are a soldier and in the heat of battle you run away? What happens? Huh? You can be shot to kill. Yeah. For example, in the heat of battle you're running, shoot to kill. If it's not in the heat of battle and you survive, for example, what, what happened? Court martial. So now the question is this. Well, I'm afraid of the enemy. That's why you, you, become, you become a coward. I'm afraid of the enemy. Well, is your fear misplaced? What if you're afraid of the enemy, but actually your army is more powerful, so you're not afraid of the court martial? You, you'd rather die being hanged than die fighting. You see, again, it's misplaced fear. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be shot. What if they put you on a firing squad? You'll still be shot <laughs> with no honor. So what cowardice is misplaced fear. I think, I think we have to evaluate what we are afraid of. And what God says is, fear me. Now, this is a ministry that has been given to us. When a person becomes a Christian, not only do they become part of the family, they are given a purpose. This is our ministry. That is our purpose. What, how do you know what, that, that you are fulfilling the purpose of God? How do you know it's the purpose of God? When God gives you a purpose, it's always something that is beyond yourself. It's not something that is easy. If it's easy, everybody can do it. So it's always beyond yourself. Now, the moment you start doing that, that is where you will find fulfillment. I don't know what, if it's addiction or what, there is something so fulfilling when we do something beyond normal, right? Why, why is it that we admire athletes so much? They're doing something that we cannot do. Yeah. And then, uh, well, you remember during, during those, uh, I'm, I don't follow the NBA that much right now. I am an old timer in NBA, you know. Uh, well, well, you look at the times of Michael, Michael Jordan. Remember that game with Utah Jazz? He was, he was uh, sick, he has a flu. Oh, most people, they have a flu. I'm going home. Right, right, DJ? DJ has a little cold. I'm not going to school, you know. Right? She was absent twice this week for having colds. But Michael Jordan, he was being given an IV in the locker room. Yeah. And, and it's a critical game. I forgot why it was a critical game. It was a long time ago since the Bulls won. You know? uh, but it was a critical game. Man, the guy was sick. He, he decided, I'll, I'll do this. And all of us who watched that, how many of you here was alive already to watch the game? Huh? You're not alive yet. You, you, you watch that, you say, wow. Suddenly, if you have no money, I want to buy the shirt. I want to buy the shoes. Because it is something that is beyond you. It's so fulfilling. Have you listened to these athletes when they talk? They accomplish something beyond normal that they say, wow. It's their purpose. You know. It's their purpose. You know that you are fulfilling the purpose of God in your life because God is telling you to do something that is beyond you in the normal. I think we are all looking for easy tasks. Oh, this, this, is, this is too easy. That's why I was, I was telling you this morning, you, you analyze the, the personality of Donald Trump. You, you may not like his mouth. His, I mean... Who likes his tongue, you know? Uh, sometimes I think he need to learn from, from Mayor Richard Daly, the, the last Daly. You know, whenever he campaigns, his campaign manager always tells him, Mayor Daly, for as long as you don't talk, you will win, you know? Uh, I think, <laughs> I think as, uh, Trump has to learn from that some, sometime. But, but you look at him under, under constant barrage of attacks from the very beginning. I was looking at that. It takes a lot of strength to be able to withstand that. You have, I, I, have, I have to admire that. Man, I said, look at that thing. You know? I think some people, a little bit of pressure, they cow out right away. Why? Because it's a ministry. 
uh, Richard Daly was uh, under a lot of pressure. This was before he retired. A couple of years before he retired, um, Michael Altman was telling me this. He has a group, group of students that he brings to the city hall uh, every year. And he said, so Mayor Daly was with them. And one, one student was uh, like asking Mayor Daly, uh, how do you get into politics? And Mayor Daly answered this el uh, I don't know, elementary of high or high school students, answered them and says, you know, guys, don't just enter politics for entering politics. It's, it's, it's hard. There's a lot of pressure. He said, you have to enter politics, he said, as a calling. And he used the word calling, Michael. Michael Altman told me. I was surprised Mayor Daly said that. He said, you have to believe that this is your calling. I mean, look, look at those politicians. The moment they say something, the media is, is, uh, is spinning. The me You've got to be called to do that. that. It's beyond yourself. You know? to, to, look, to be a soldier. Who in their right mind will get a job? I mean, how, how much does a cop make? But you can be shot anytime. Huh? It doesn't make sense. Why, why will somebody want to be a soldier? You've got to be nuts. You know? That's why in the old days, the soldiers are family members. There was no official army. The moment there's a war, then they come. They're depending. But professional soldiers, you are, you are, being, you are being given a salary every, every month, and you look at your gun, it's more expensive than your salary. You, know, you look at your outfit that they give to you, you said, man, if I can sell this, I'll make money. Why, why will they will do that? Some people, well, because of papers. It's got to be beyond papers. Look, I, I don't think somebody goes to be a soldier. Remember during the last Iraq war, they say, why do they want to be a soldier? Oh, because they will be given citizenship if they die. They are a citizen posthumously. You know? so, why will, what's the use of being a citizen? You're dead. Or you continue reading the story. Because then their loved ones will automatically be given their papers also. That becomes their purpose. It's not just being a soldier. You see? Some of them jump out of the truck. They're looking at the sky. They blink. It's St. Peter already, you know? And their salary is not that much. I mean, how, how much does a soldier make? It's, 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 it's not that much. Yeah? But that's their calling. That's their purpose. You see? You have, you, you have to have something that is beyond, it will require something greater. For, it will elicit greater energy, greater drive, and man, you've got to find drive where there is no drive. You know? That's purpose. We have been given that. And Paul said, this is, I mean, look, when Paul was called, Paul, I will show you how much suffering you're going to endure. That's his call. I'm going to show you. I will, I will make you stand before kings. You will suffer. I'll show you. Who will say yes? What, for example, if I'm Jesus and say, I'm calling people right now. I'm calling volunteers for the ministry. Say I'm Jesus. You know? And you're thinking, what, what is it all about, Jesus? Well, I'll provide for all your needs. By the way, don't take extra bag. Don't take extra clothes. Live by faith. And by the way, people will stone you. They will reject you. You'll be like a lamb to the slaughter. Will you still raise your hand? Now, in mind, we may say, yes, I will. In reality, we run away. It's got to be beyond you. It's got to be beyond you. That is the purpose. It also tells us, and this is by the mercy of God, it is the mercy of God that gives us this purpose. Therefore, when people are not born again, a lot of people are living with the wrong purpose. That's the, I, I told you, it came to me uh, as, as, like when I came here, it's to study. It's my purpose. I never realized God would have me pastor a church here. For most of us, Filipinos, when we come here, it's to make a better life for ourselves. I mean, look, you compare our livelihood from the Philippines to here, it's a lot better here. So our mission statement is actually to make money here. But you know, I, I just come to realize that uh, in the New Testament, during the persecution, the Christians were being scattered. Now, in their mind, we are being scattered. 
But you know, in the mind of God, you're not being scattered. I'm sending you out as missionaries. And through this uh, uh, dia dia diaspora, what happened was churches will, were, were established all across the Roman world. They never went there intentionally. They were running for their lives. And they, when they were running for their lives, they find themselves in Ephesus and they start witnessing. You see, what they thought God was, was uh, uh, they were being pursued, they were running for their lives. But God is like, no, you're not running for your lives. I'm actually sending you there. That's the higher purpose. Look, the, uh, the brothers of Joseph said, let's kill this boy who wants to rule over us. He doesn't need to be one of the heirs of our father. Our father is rich. Let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. That's what they think. And Joseph was there in the uh, cistern thinking, man, my brothers hate me. They want me dead. Ah, oh, I'm going to be a slave. I don't know when it came to him. Maybe it took so many years, but it dawned on him when he became prime minister. Whoa, what my brothers meant for evil, actually God turned it around for good and for the saving of many lives. That's why when his brothers asked him, are you going to take vengeance? He gave the answer right away. He didn't say, let me think about that, okay? Give me a day. Give me a couple of days. Let me see I'm the prime minister now. Let me see what I'm going to do with you. He answered it right away. Why is the meditation of his heart? He began to realize. You see, all of us here, one way or the other, we are going through some difficulties in our lives. Well, our minds can be so focused in those difficulties. Instead of asking, why am I going through this? What is it that God wants me to see and do? Because believe me, our, our little brain can't handle it sometimes. Well, maybe a lot of times. God will, will, look, I was thinking to myself, if God talked to me in the Philippines and said, I want you to go to America and, and, and pastor there. I'm going to say no, perhaps. Why? I was thinking all my heroes are from America. I mean, all the books that I read are from America. Why do they need another Filipino pastor who's going to listen to me? But God did not disclose it to me. I thought I was just coming here to study. I never realized I will start a ministry here in Chicago. I never planned this. It's, it's not part of my, my grand plan. I was just going to study here and then go back to the Philippines. Well, God has a different purpose. It's got to be beyond you. you see? It's got to be beyond your own planning. Therefore, because we are given ministry, Christians are not saved to sit. We are saved to serve. Ephesians 2.10 We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. What is our purpose? There is a path called good works. God prepared it beforehand. You know, ministry is like this. That's why we, we are not supposed to be, to be envious. We see, we see somebody uh, with a monstrous television ministry. I mean, you look at Pat Robertson, phenomenal guy, you know, a truly an apostle. And, and you, you say, wow, I would like to do that. And, and because he becomes, I would like to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I would like to do that. I would like to do that, you know. And you begin to wear your hair like Pat Robertson. You begin to talk like Pat Robertson. You know, you even go to his school uh, to take pictures with Pat Robertson and all of those things. But look, if it is not your purpose, you're not going to be able to do it. The Bible says all of us here beforehand, say beforehand, there is a good work prepared for us. That's it. That's our purpose. And you know the testimony of uh, Rad, uh, Rad, uh, Rad, uh, Reinhard Banke. Was it his dad or grandfather? I forgot. Dying in a village, right? And this missionary got lost. Yeah. The missionary got lost in Germany of all places. You know, got lost. And got lost and found the house of uh, Reinhardt's, I think, grandfather or father. I think, is it grandfather? Grandfather? Found the house. The guy is sick. Pray for him, witness to him, got him healed, got him saved. 
What happened to that missionary? I do not know. But that is his, that's his good work. It gave birth to Reinhard Bunke. The most amazing thing that I have heard, though, is Yong Gi Cho. Remember his, his story? He was dying of tuberculosis, so he was placed in this house to die. That's what I want to eat. And the Lord spoke to, a, to, a, to an American uh, woman missionary. And God told this missionary, go to that young man and witness to him. And he was Buddhist, so she said, she will, she will knock on his door and he will scream at, at her, get out of here. But the missionary will come back the following day. And, and he will speak ill to her, but the missionary will keep coming. One day the missionary, I think, was crying <laughs> because Yong Gichi was very angry when he was dying. And, she, and he said, why are you crying? Well, he said, because God told me to come here and witness to you and pray for you. Well, Yong Gichu was touched. So what happened after Yong Gichu? He got saved, got healed, established the biggest church in human history. What's the name of that lady? I do not know. That is his purpose. Only him, only her was called to do that. You see? You have to ask yourself, what is your purpose it's already prepared beforehand by God. It's not something that God will, well, you, you, get, you just get saved. Let me figure out what your job is. There is already a job, each and every one of us. There is already a job God prepared beforehand. That's why we cannot shrink back. That's the ministry. You know, you, you have heard of these phenomenal evangelists. I like this, uh, this guy. This is John Alexander Dowie. That he's got a prayer partner. He's got a prayer partner that uh, will, will be in the place where he's having a crusade two, three months before ahead, ahead of time. We don't even know his name. When Dr. Lester Samuel launched in his ministry, he was 17 years old, I think, or 14, maybe 17. His friend saw him, Lester, where are you going? He said, well, I'm going to preach. He said, I'm going with you. He said, well, I don't know I'm going. Well, you have no car. I have a car. So this guy started driving Lester to towns in Indiana. Yeah. And then they part ways. I don't know what happened. And Lester says, for the life of me, I don't remember his name. He fulfilled his purpose. There is a purpose prepared beforehand for you and me. What is that purpose? You've got to find it. But one test is it will do good. If what you're doing right now is not yielding good, <laughs> either you're not doing it right or it's your wrong good work pre prepared beforehand. People, sh people should be able to taste it. You know, you know you're doing because people should be able to taste it and they will know it's good. They'll benefit from it. That is prepared beforehand by God. We need to find that out. So it is when we use our abilities for good works, for God, that we find our purpose. That the, when, when you begin to realize that the pressures coming from the world will begin to diminish its strength in your life. Um, who is this? Who invented X-ray? Do you guys remember? I don't remember. I used to know her. What's, it, what's her name? The X-ray lady, okay? Uh, I forgot her name. She, 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 what? What's her name? Mad is that Madame Curie? Okay. I think, I think you're right. Okay, you're right. Let's, let's say you're right. She could not... She could not uh, figure out how to finalize her invention. She, she's Jewish. And she's, she's very tired. And people are telling her, rest. She won't rest. Well, uh, when you're so tired, but she dedicated herself to making that. 
She's so tired, she just fell, fell and fell asleep. While she was sleeping, she dreamt of the x-ray. God gave her uh, the missing ideas and Bennett. That's her purpose. Yeah. And so the world will forever be blessed because of her x-ray. It improved. That is her purpose. Huh? A lot of people live and die without knowing their purpose. But that purpose, it will, it will do some good. It will really do some good. Good beforehand. Now, the moment you see that, you cannot uh, cow out. You, have, you cannot lose heart. You have to say, that is my purpose. I'm going to do that. You see? When, 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 when Billy Graham died, Franklin was testifying that when she was laying down on bed, there will be time for, for hours, he said. Billy will just be looking at, uh, what's her name, the, the wife? Ruth, right? right? Yeah. Ruth. For, for hours, they will, they will just be looking. But if you followed Ruth's ministry, you know what she said? Where God called me to become, to be a husband to, to Billy Graham. To, uh, to, be a, to be a wife, not husband. But I'm <sighs> to be a wife to Billy Graham. And then, and then she said, I'm here to, to, uh, I'm here to support him. Can, can you imagine? Uh, you, you are raising your kids in the house, and your husband is always traveling, and you have to keep your, your family together. And, you know, and, and Billy was a young man just traveling all over the world, wanted by everybody to speak. That's a tough call. By the way, she was a, I think she was a missionary herself. Yeah, China. China. And, she, and she found her purpose. Now, for, for some feminists, they'll say, oh, you never reach your potential. You're happy with that. I'll tell you, a lot of women will be more than happy to be the wife of Billy Graham. That guy changed our world. And she found her purpose. The life of Billy Graham will never be mentioned without mentioning Ruth. That's her purpose. And, and it, it did a lot of good. On the other hand, I know some, uh, kasi yung, ano, eh, yung uh, husband and wife a team. Uh, they thought, it's applied across the board. So you will find that a lot of uh, churches right now, they're being co-pastored by the husband and the wife. Same title, you know. Uh, equal. That's not, uh, I really don't see it in the Bible. Why? Because the woman was, was so uh, ignored, she, she doesn't find her purpose. Daisy Osborne, the wife of uh, T.L., Every time T.L. go to a place for a crusade, Daisy will be there sometimes for six months. He will hold, she will hold crusades, ministers' meetings, so that the grand crusade of, of uh, T.L. Osborne will have, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people. Well, Lester told, told uh, T.L. one day, hey, T.L., you're not, because T.L. doesn't want to come back to the U.S. He said, he said the Americans don't want to listen to the gospel. So, so they, uh, T.L. and Daisy will always be overseas. But, but Lester is also the same. But Lester loves missionaries like that. So Lester went to T.L. one day and said, T.L., you don't come that much to the, to the U.S. anymore. The Americans are forgetting you. And he said, what do you mean? I love missions. Yeah, but the Americans, are not, remember that is your country. That's where your sport is coming from. Uh, come back to the U.S., he said. Come back to the U.S. They are forgetting you. You need to come back and bless the U.S. So he, 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 came, he came back. When T.L. Osborne came back here, I mean, left and right, invitations were coming in, and he was receiving such honors and great love gifts and seminar speakers, conference speakers, whatever you want, uh, T.L., they'll give it to him. You know what happened? Nobody was inviting Daisy. 
But Daisy was the leg work. Do you know that it made Daisy upset? It was arrested by TL, but bitterness started creeping in her heart. Yeah. That's why you will notice that in the last years of the ministry of TL, she was promoting Daisy all the time. Well, because her purpose was beside uh, TL. Sometimes it goes beyond that. There are, there are good works that the Lord prepared for us to do. Know that. And do, it will be beyond you already. To be, to be a missionary to China and then suddenly you are a wife of uh, Billy Graham and you're staying in North Carolina most of the time while your husband travels all over the world. That, be, believe me, that is challenging. I don't know how challenging because I have never been a wife, you know. But uh, you, can, you can just imagine that is very challenging. And sometimes I, I look at my wife, she, come, she, she drives. I don't know why she won't have my truck repaired. But, uh, but uh, she, she drives most of the time now. And she'll be very tired and she will come home. I said, what's happening? I just go home. Why? Because you're having your lunch. Sometimes I want to feel convicted, but I don't feel convicted. You know, so I, just, I just enjoy it. But uh, she has more brains than me. She has more skills than me. But she always tells me that she finds this to be her calling. Yeah. By the way, not because she cannot find a job. I have never seen my wife get rejected in a job. You know, this lady that she is, she is taking care of right now, uh, she, she's taking care of her so much, I, I think she wanted to adopt her as her daughter or something like that. Yeah. And there were times the, the lady is showing her, hey, these are the, uh, of her finances. And I told my wife, don't touch it. Don't look at it. That's not why you're there. You're there to help. And she said that there were times the lady will try to discuss with her her finances. And I told my wife, the answer is this. I will not come between you and your daughter. I'm not here for that. And from then on, it was never discussed again. Because sometimes we forget our purpose. This lady, in her, in her late years, is not being taken care of by her daughter. She lacks attention. She lacks love. Very demanding. But my wife finds it her mission right now to minister to her. She already led her to the Lord. They are already having, uh, I think she's having more devotions with her now than with me. You know? She feeds her first before she feeds me now. Uh, you know? But you need to find your purpose. You really need to, and that could be it. You see, that could be it. What is your purpose? The moment you find it, don't shrink from it. Some people tell me, well, this is what I'm going to do. I believe God wants me to do this. And then a year later, they forget about it. They shrink away from it. I don't know how many people told me, Pastor Sam, I'm going to go with you in missions. After they say that, they forget about it. You, you, I'm not saying it's your purpose, but you've got to know it. And don't shrink back from it. Well, pastor said we're going to do this. Uh, we're not doing it anymore. You see? You've got to know your purpose. And it was prepared for you beforehand. And nobody can do it the way you will do it. Somebody, somebody may be able to do it better than you, but nobody will be able to do it like you will do it. Yeah. Nobody will be able to do it like you will do it. Yeah. Sometimes I... I my wife will tell me this. Ano kayang nangyari sa akin kung uh, iba na pangasawa ko? Maybe she was, she was expecting I'll be romantic. Oh, I'll die. I'm not like that, you know. I, uh, I look at my wife and I say, ah, kawawa naman yung mister mo. Sabi ko yung ugali mong yan. Ako. <laughs> Bahag ginawa mo ng kilawin. You know? I, I really pity that guy. Uh, 
And say, why are you like that? I said, I don't know why I'm like this also, you know. But I said, she will be very upset. She'll be screaming all over the house. Some men will be wearing a skirt when they hear that. For me, it's funny. Yeah. I just, she'll, she'll be screaming, okay, okay, ta- I'm screaming, prepare my lunch. I'm hungry. And you know what she does? She actually obeys. I don't know what's wrong with that lady sometimes, you know. But uh, she found her purpose. Yeah. I don't know if Joseph found her, his purpose already. You know? Before he wants to be a billionaire and a businessman, oh, he's going to go to the Air Force. Maybe he's confused or something. You know? yeah. DJ is consistent. She's going to be a doctor. Amen. John wanted to become a uh, firefighter. Then you, you, you want to teach English. And then you, you want to become Barney. You know? <laughs> I know what you're doing at Trinity, John. I hope that's final, huh? But the moment you find your purpose, don't, don't shy away from it. Instead of losing heart, listen to this. Lose your heartlessness. So it's one thing. Do not lose heart. Lose heartlessness. What is a heartless person? Okay. I, I told her, I told her, I found out she has money, right? Well, you have no money yet, okay? So I found out she has money. So I told her, Miss, Miss Diane, if you give me all of your money, within three months, it's going to double. No, she, she's crazy. She doesn't think. Really? But I am a scam artist. I knew that I'm scamming her. All I want is for her to give me my money and then I'll disappear. How will people call me? Heartless. I mean, we, we read the news of the teachers teacher's fund in the Philippines really was very upset with that because he, they stole billions not dollars of pesos from the teachers no no uh, college fund how do you call that thing that we rent in the Philippines uh, in Baguio the building cap the cap building yeah man billions of, of pesos so I told Willie what happened. Well, he said, well, the, the payoff is on the Santos and everything else. And he said, you know what upsets me, brother? I said, what? He said, one time I was eating here in Makati, and while, and while all of these parents are crying because the scholarship for their kids are gone, I said, I went to this, I have a big meeting in this expensive hotel, in in, in expensive restaurant in Makati. He said, it's a very expensive restaurant. I said, I have, I'm having executives from from all over Asia, and we're meeting there. And he said, I found this scam artist who stole billions. He's on the other table. He said, he's dining with senators and government officials, and he is not in jail. You know how you call that? Heartless. Yeah. Heartless, why? Because perhaps he found his purpose. I'm going to develop this college plan so that the poor parents in the Philippines can save for their newborn child. So a noble purpose. You are poor, you give me 20 pesos per month. By the time your child is in college, don't worry about it. Whatever course they want. Wow, that's a marvelous plan, right? Much like our social security. Marvelous plan. Then he stole the money. He lost his heart. He became heartless. He doesn't care. Uh, Brother Willie was was telling me that uh, one one of his employees, his his wife called him and said, Boss Willie, come. His, His husband is trying to commit suicide. He said, Boss, we are poor. And I bought that plan because I want my 
child to go to college. And they stole it. I have nothing. He wants to commit suicide. So Larry really came up with some funds to send his uh, uh, child to college. But the guy who stole it, this heartless person. When you, when you walk away from your purpose, that's when you become heartless. You have ulterior motive to take advantage of others for self-gain. Now that we are born again, we need to give that up and have integrity. Okay. Here are some of the characteristics that we need to display to say that we are not losing heart. Okay, number one, renounce the things hidden because of shame. I'm, I'm going to scam you. I will not tell her that. Why? It's embarrassing. That means all I want is to get your money so I can be rich, and I don't care if all of you go bankrupt. I will not say that. Why? It's embarrassing. You know, when, when the Bible says, renounce the things hidden because of shame, what it means is this. Be up front with others. Can you just tell the truth? Yeah. Can you just? You know what breaks people's heart? When somebody has ulterior motive, oh, that's really heartbreaking. I, I thought, I don't know if uh, we were going to uh, the centennial celebration of Pasusa Street. My wife is the one who, who books the hotels. Uh, who was with us? Aunt Joseph? James was with us. What about the big ones? We, we just left them in the house, yeah? And so she was, she was telling this hotel, can you please, is there a room? So actually we were put in the handicap room. I don't know why, maybe because I look handicapped or something, you know. But we were, it's a Filipina that is in the front desk and gave us a favor. But she was looking for hotels for others, for Brother Willie. And, and she found this hotel close by. Man, the picture is good. Well, Brother Willie went there. There are roaches all over the place. Brother Willie was just, I think, a little bit shy and holding back. Siguro ko hindi born na ganyan, minura na ako noon. Sabi niya sa akin, I could not sleep. I said, why? Oh, there are roaches crawling all over the place. The picture though is good. Huh? Have you ever buy something from the internet? The picture is good. And the product was delivered. Somebody opened the product. And, Who is this? Oh, that's not mine. That's not. Because even you, you are, you are very embarrassed with what you bought. But the picture is good. Huh? hidden things. So what Paul is saying here is, if you don't want to lose heart and you don't become heartless, what you need to do is be a front with others. Don't have hidden motives for what you will do. Hidden or secret is opposite of openness. So a, a genuine Christian servant's life is an open book. It's an open door. Uh, when you say we're going to do this, that means we're going to do Again, let me go back to you, the missions in the Philippines. These medical missions, the, they died. I think the, the bus went up the... I don't know what happened to that in Baguio City. Well, they advertised they're going on medical missions. Well, it turned out before they went on medical mission, they died. It, these are the hidden things. When, when you say, we're going to do this, that's the first thing you do. But some people are hiding it. I'll, I'll tell you how, how, uh, how if you want to go on tour uh, in Israel, for this certain price, I'll package it, for this certain price, all I need are five tourists and I will be free for this certain price. For this certain price, all I need is ten and I will be free. For this certain price, I need 20 and I will be free. For this certain price, I need 30 and I will be free. The same tour. So, I wanted to make sure that I go to Israel. So I choose the, the Malangi. Oh, sister, this is the cheapest. No, it's not. You have hidden motive. What you want is to go there for free 
and to accomplish it with very few numbers of participants. Now I go to these tools like this. Uh, we will be offered a very cheap study tools because, and they will put that this is for pastors and this and that. These are the qualifications. We are giving it to you very cheap and they are really very cheap because we want you to bring back, if you like it, we want you to bring your church members into this tour. And they will normally say, if you bring 20, you will be free. But then some people say, well, you know, we, it's very cheap. It's, it's this and that and this. No, it's not very cheap. Not very cheap, you see. And then you go there and, you know, I really don't like it the first time I went to Israel. They are counting the olives that we are eating. And, and you know, you, you eat olives on the first day, it's okay. You eat olive twice on the same day, it's no longer beginning to sound okay. You know, to the extent that I was no longer eating. So I, told, I will tell Willie, hey, hey, let's, and it's an expensive tour, my first study tour in, in, in Israel. I told Willie, hey, after we arrive in the hotel, let's go out and let's go to the grocery store. Let's eat. And we will find our tour director buying cans of olive. And then the following day, okay, three olives each. Ah, uh, you know, that's, that's the seat. And so I end up, just to put something in my stomach, hanapi, kainin ko na lang yung, ano, yung rice krispies without sugar. Yeah. So I will take three rice krispies without sugar, and that will be my, I will not eat anything more. I hated that taste. You know? I don't know how, how a brother really endures it, but he eats everything, you know. I hate the taste. And he will be telling me, mapili ha kasi, sabi ko, anong pili? Araw-araw na lang ganyan. You know. And then the tour director found out I'm taking three uh, Rice Krispies without sugar. He said, only one Rice Krispies. <laughs> uh. Yeah. That's it. Well, they said first class food and all of these things, all these accommodations, the city things. Now listen. When you minister and do your ministry, don't be heartless. Don't have ulterior motive. When you say, I'm going to do this, don't do this for other reasons. Don't say, well, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really hoping that that will be my stepping stone. I'm really hoping that my name will be published all over the place. That's heartlessness. Because some people will be expecting that you will be doing certain things. It turns out you have other motives. He is not deceptive. He does not say one thing and mean another. Decept, the word deceptive here actually is a fishing term. It's baiting a hook. Have you ever fished? You, you know, fishermen are, are very deceptive. Uh, deceptive to whom? To the fish. They will, <laughs> they will bring, and now they have these modern baits. They are not real. They are plastic. Made in China, you know. And they will cast that bait. In the old days, it's real worms. They'll, they'll cast that bait. And, and you're, you, you, you know there's fish there, and you're telling the fish, oh, yummy, you know. You, you bite this, and you will be satisfied. So the thing bit the thing, and it, there's a hook. That's what they mean by deceptive. There's a hook. You see, you are putting out baits that has different colors, alluring, that people can, can gravitate to. Yeah. And then what happened? There was a seminar in, in Muntinlupa, I was told. They advertised, these are the speakers. The organizers... Well, the, the main organizer who gathered the people is, was a student of mine, so he told me this. He was never told that the organizers uh, 
ulterior motive was to take pictures. They're going to showcase this. So they will raise money. So the names are big names. Well, on the day of the seminar, he was called, how many people are there? There were only like 200 people. They were expecting at least 500. They ran the place that was at 500. 200 people, he said, well, it's not going to be alluring to the speakers. You know what, what my students said? Well, Pastor Jose, I was told, you know, we will be late. There's, there's some uh, business that I need, that's pressing that we need to attend to. Can you just handle it? And you know what he did? He shows my videos. Yeah. Because the week before that, I had a seminar. And they took videos. So I actually have double seminar. The second one is for free. I said, why did you do that? It's not my seminar. What if he finds out? Oh, he doesn't care. That he just wants pictures. The moment I have 500 people, promotions, ulterior motive. There's a bait. There's a hook. We're going to Hagayan de Oro this, uh, this August. Uh, this is my second attempt to go there. You know why I called up the other one? It turned out it's one of the, cut this out, okay. It's, it's one of the most corrupt cities in, in, in comes to missions. If you want a big crowd, say you want 20,000 people in your crusade, they'll gather it, but you pay. This is the place where I told you they beat up a Korean minister because he was supposed to send one million pesos for advertisement. They, they, uh, they divide the money among the organizers and they can come up with 20,000. Deceptive. You see, bait. So if you are baiting people, saying one thing, but offering another thing, that's, that's deceptive. He does not twist or adulterate the word of God. Under pressure, meaning if you say we're, we're going to teach the word of God, we're going to teach the word of God. You see, you don't deceive. If you say this is, this is a seminar where you can, you can be taught, you're going to be doing this, make sure it's the word of God. My problem is when you promise the word of God and you teach something else. When you say it's the word of God, that means what the word says is what you teach, even if it offends the sensitivity of others. He manifests the truth. He speaks it plainly for people to understand simply, meaning faithful expression of the truth. And of course, you have to live in integrity. That's how, that's how uh, you don't lose heart. If you don't do those things, you will start losing heart. And then keep preaching the gospel. Do not veil it. When you say, do not veil it, put it out in the open. You see the commercial of Verizon? The only network that, and then there is a cloth. It's veiled. People can see it, but it's veiled. Here is the opposite. Keep preaching the gospel. Put it out in the open. Why? A veiled gospel has devastating effects. You know. What, for example, if I tell you, if you follow the Lord, everything is going to be okay. Well, that's a true statement. God will give you a big house. God will give you a brand new car every five years. You're going to be a millionaire. Whew. What if it doesn't happen? People will begin to say, I thought we were told that's what's going to happen. That's veiled. Okay? When you begin to put a veiled gospel, people will perish People who listen to a veiled gospel are also blind. And sometimes we listen to a veiled gospel because that's what we want. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Now listen, the gospel at the very end you know what you see if it's a true gospel? You see Jesus. That means it's the likeness of Jesus. It's the word of truth. A veiled gospel is something else. You preach Christ. A veiled gospel is when you begin to say something that is not in the scriptures. Well, you will not be as popular as others. You will not uh, be followed by as many people as others. But it's the true gospel got to really teach it. You've got to say, this is, you want to live godly, you will be persecuted. You know? 
I mean, sometimes people say, well, all things work together for good. We discussed that in the last two Sundays. Well, don't veil it. Because people begin to say, well, whatever happened to you, all things, no, not all things will work together for good. These are people who stand for what is right, for the truth. There's pressure. They stand for it. It will work together for good. Joseph stood for his dream given by God. It all worked out for good. You see, Daniel stood for what is right, will not uh, compromise his uh, being Jewish, eat the right food, only kosher. What happened? He served four kings. You see? Because it's not, it's not veiled. Now, when you are under pressure and you want to get out of pressure, there are certain equipment. By the way, did you watch the news? Uh, Florida International University. Man. Uh, what's that? I don't know how many yards span is that. It collapsed. And there are some, some cars. Now, they, yesterday they changed from rescue to, uh, I forgot the term. Recovery, yeah. From rescue to recovery. And now you will begin to see crane. You will begin to see this uh, diamond sauce, the big sauce. Because they are anticipating nobody had already survived underneath. So they are just trying to uh, give dignity to whoever is there. You see? What is that? They have equipment. Now when you are under pressure and you are trying to defeat the enemy, there are equipments that God gives to us. Number one equipment starts on verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 4. First is the light of Jesus. John 1 verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Because Jesus is life and you receive him, you have light already. Life is the light of men. You cannot say, well, I don't see. It's dark. You have Jesus. It's the light of men. John 9, verse 5. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. That's why our gospel is not failed because Jesus is light. None of us here ought to live in darkness. Now, this is, this is the problem now. I would assume, and I think I'm right on this one, all of a lot of us have different opinions on a lot of things. You know, that's normal to being human. What should settle that? What should settle that is the Bible. It's Jesus. He is light. You know, there's a lot of discussions about politics, about same-sex marriage, about abortion. For us Christians, what will settle that is not our political parties, or our social science courses, what settles it is the word of God. John 1 verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not understand it. What does it mean? When our heart is blinded, when our heart is darkened, and Jesus comes and sheds light, you will not understand it. Is it? I told you about that Senate hearing on abortion. They begin to see, see, show these babies in the womb. They put the scalpel. Uh, the, 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 the baby blocks and the arm gets cut. Oh, that's a baby right there in the womb. And he used the other arm. And the baby is struggling. Baby is struggling. Well, well, it's being cut. And when we were studying this, they show how the presentation to the Senate hearing uh, on this case they tilted the television screen a little bit. You know how when, when, when uh, well, let's, you, know, you tilt it a little bit, you will not see it clearly as you did. So they tilt it a little bit so, so that the senators hearing it and the aides will not see it completely. But they can still see it. Well, the pro-life showing this after the presentation, the senators look at that and begin to say, okay, we'll still approve it. And they begin to come up with ideas. That's a fetus. They won't call it a baby. What is that? You know why? Because their heart, believe me when I say this, their heart is already darkened. And if the heart is darkened, when light shines, they could not understand. I could not understand why that is alive. 
I could not. Can, can you imagine uh, right now there are, uh, there are doctors that the moment the baby comes out, they will still abort it. They call it, uh, I, I don't know how to tell you, post-delivery abortion, how do they call it? Post-delivery, after it's delivered already. You know, when the baby is already delivered, you don't abort it anymore. You murder it. You murder it. And you listen to these people. How can you say it's not life? How can you say there's heartbeat, there's body parts, there's nose. Now with uh, how, how do you call this uh, high tech ultrasound, they will begin to see who the baby looks like while in the womb. And then you look at that and you begin to say, "Oh, it's a fetus." I'll tell you the reason. Because the heart is darkened. There is no reasoning to a darkened heart. Light shines, and the Bible says they did not comprehend it. Now, light here is not intellectual power or, or intellectual or mental understanding. So you would believe it's, it's actually the living word. Light is Jesus in your heart. That's why it doesn't make sense. The unbelievers actually called, uh, called, calls us backwards, uh, unscientific, uh, archaic. Why, why, can't you, why can't you accept it? Huh? Look, if, if he likes a boy and he's a boy, what's wrong with that? We became the one that is out of touch with. with yeah, you know why? Because light shines. You can show it from the scriptures. Light shines and it's Jesus I mean, the new Pope right now, man, they, they doctored some, some pictures of Benedict because he's very conservative, trying to show that uh, he's supportive of Francis. What, what is that? Because when the, heart is, when the heart is already darkened, there is no reasoning. There is just no reasoning. Light comes and did not understand it. Why? Because light here is the presence of the living God. Pastor, Pastor Jin Ho was telling me that he was watching a documentary of the four big wars in Israel. He said it's a Korean presentation. And he said there was this story, unbelievable victory. And the Koreans said, you know how, how Asians, Asians, we, we like the word fortune or luck, right? We even have fortune cookies. I remember when, when, when uh, DJ was very small. She's not very small now. We will go to a Chinese restaurant. Well, we did. And there's a Chinese. They don't know how to read it, right? Papa, Mama, what does it say? It says, be obedient to your father. You know? <laughs> and they'll <sighs> yeah. The Korean uh, person who was doing the documentary said, oh, this is unbelievable, he said. You know how Koreans are? Oh, they're always very loud. This is unbelievable. This is good fortune. He's smiling at those Israelis. This is good luck. And, and Pastor Jesus looked at me and says, I told my wife, those people are blinded. That's not fortune. That's not luck. That's God. How come he can see God and the person making the documentary can see fortune cookies? heart. Because the other person refuses to acknowledge there is God. This is beyond reason why they were surviving this. And it's, it so happened that when he was telling me the story in, in the side of the Jordan during the war of, Yom, uh, war of Purim, it so happened that I also heard the story. He said, yeah, yeah, that's what they were saying. That's what they were saying. You know? And they say, at the end, Pure luck. Ah. For, fortune is smiling at them. But Jin Hao says, that's God. What's the difference? The heart. For some people who say, well, you're just lucky. So, you know, when we have, you know, good luck. I, I don't like that. What do we say? God bless you. <laughs> Shalom, prosper. You know? Be successful in what you do. We don't say good luck. That's, that's Asian. That's Chinese. We are Bible. 
This is one of the reasons why Jesus lived in us. Jesus lived in us because he really wants that light. He doesn't want any of us to walk in darkness. Now, can you imagine if you're under tremendous pressure? Is this really true? Yeah. Well, the, the guy, what, for example, if you're living in the first century, the guy says, if I will just curse Jesus right now, I will leave, I will be set free. Is that really true? Yeah, let's, let's just be practical. Remember that there, there, there's a movie about, about Muslims taking over Israel? Uh, and the priest says, let's convert to, to Islam and repent later. So they said, let's convert to Islam and repent later. And the, the knight says, you told me all I need uh, as much about religion as you can tell me. And some, some people act like that. Let's just convert right now to Islam and repent later. Well, you're, you're abusing the grace of God. You're, you're saying that you can compromise now. You see? But then, well, I'm confused. If Jesus is in you, you cannot be confused. You, you, you did not receive the spirit of timidity or confusion, but sound mind. What is required of us is to do the right thing. But that's the equipment. The light comes. So now we will go back to what I said originally. Uh, cowardice is misplaced fear. What are you afraid of? Yeah. People don't do the right thing because they are afraid of something. What are you afraid of? Cowardice, misplaced fear. But if truly Jesus is in your heart, light is there. No, don't, don't be faked. May people, they say, we know Jesus, but they keep living in darkness. They don't know Jesus. The heart is blinded. Because if Jesus is in your heart, light is there. You know it is. It's in there. It's there. Amen.